It's Tuesday, September 15. This is the news on PBCJ. I'm Simone Absalom. Effective immediately, water restrictions imposed on customers served by the Constant Spring Water Treatment Plant are suspended. The National Water Commission, NWC, says the continuous rainfall over the past few weeks has resulted in an increase in stream flows in the Wagwater watershed area and improved storage levels at Hermitage Dam. According to the NWC, as of Monday, September 14, the Hermitage Dam is at a water capacity of 98%. The company encourages customers to continue to conserve water despite the improved inflows. As the island continues to experience community transmission of the COVID-19 virus, we look at the latest COVID-19 figures as released by the Health and Wellness Ministry. Here are the details. Two new deaths and 109 new cases of COVID-19 were reported by the Health Ministry for Monday. This brings the total deaths to 46 and the overall case number to 4,042. The deceased are a 44-year-old female from Manchester with a history of hypertension and diabetes, and also 87-year-old female from Clarendon with an history of hypertension. This case was previously under investigation. The number of active cases now stands at 2,753. The ministry also reported that two persons have recovered from the virus, pushing the total to 1,163. The breakdown for the new cases is as follows. 14 were reported in St. Catherine, 23 in Kingston and St. Andrew, 19 cases were reported in St. Thomas, 16 in Portland and 8 in Trelawney, 4 in Clarendon, two in Hanover, five in St. Elizabeth, and 16 in St. James. 38 persons remain in government quarantine, while 26,160 persons are in home quarantine. 101 patients are hospitalized, with 28 moderately ill and eight critical. At this time, there are 466 imported cases and 253 cases of local transmission, while 700 are contacts of confirmed cases. 239 are associated with the St. Catherine Workplace Cluster and 2,287 cases are under investigation. Melvin Pennant, PBCJ News. The new session of Parliament began today, Tuesday, September 15, 2020, with the swearing-in of Senators and Members of Parliament at 11 o'clock this morning. The ceremony took place at the Jamaica Conference Centre to facilitate social distancing in light of the COVID-19 pandemic. Access to the ceremony was restricted and members of the public joined the ceremony virtually. I place on record my gratitude to the Prime Minister, most Honorable Andrew Holness for having reappointed me to the Senate and I thank again the members of the Senate for the trust that has been placed in my stewardship for this term in the Senate. I congratulate all the members of the Senate appointed by the Prime Minister and Leader of the Opposition. Some are returnees and some are new members and I trust that in due course each member will having recognized the responsibility placed on them come to recognize the responsibility that they have to the people and the country this Jamaica land we love and that our debates and the approach that we take to the legislative process reflects the seriousness and the weight of the responsibility placed on our shoulders. Marisa Dalrymple Filbert has gotten the nod from Prime Minister Andrew Holness to be the new Speaker of the House of Representatives. This will be her second run, having served in that role from July 2011 to December 2011. The Speaker is the gatekeeper of the standing orders, those rules that govern the House, and also arbitrates to ensuring that the rights of members are protected.
Dalwin Pofilbert will be sworn in on Tuesday for the fourth consecutive term as the Jamaica Labour Party's Member of Parliament for Trelawney Southern. The MP-elect is the second woman to speak as House Speaker. The first was Violet Nielsen, who served from 1997 to 2003. Prime Minister Andrew Holness chaired the first cabinet meeting of new administration on Monday. With the bulk of the cabinet sworn in, the ministers will have to hit the ground running as pressing concerns such as the ongoing pandemic and long-standing ills such as crime will mean that there will be no honeymooning for the newly minted administration. Nine state ministers were appointed on Monday at King's House. Prime Minister Andrew Holness says they have the opportunity to make their mark despite not having overall responsibility for the ministries in which they will work. The minister who is the member of cabinet will ultimately give the direction and your job is to support that direction. Mr. Holness says the group represents a good mix of youth and experience, while stressing that the supportive role of a state minister is not an easy one. There are areas of policy that need to be explained, that needs to be championed, that need sometimes to be brought directly to the stakeholders and as Minister of State you can play that very important role of explaining policy to the public, of championing causes and policy and literally taking policy to stakeholders and explaining the policy to them and building support for the policy. Governor General, His Excellency Sir Patrick Linton Allen reminded the ministers that to serve is an opportunity to engage in nation building. I am sure the efforts you will make will be worthwhile as you discharge your responsibilities. Let excellence and honesty be your guiding principle and think carefully about the legacy that you want to leave behind as a public servant. Jamaica's judiciary arm now has an additional nine members. The legal luminaries were sworn in on Monday by Governor General His Excellency, the Most Honorable Sir Patrick Allen, during a ceremony at King's House in St. Andrew. David Frazier and Nicole Simmons have been appointed as judges of the Court of Appeal. Their appointments become effective September 21, 2020. Also taking the oath of office was Marcia Dunbar-Green, who has been appointed to act as a judge of the Court of Appeal from September 16 to December 18. Five puny judges have also been appointed. They are Natalie Hart-Hines, Carol Barnaby, I. Colin Reed, Vaughan Smith, and Tara Carr, whose appointments also become effective September 16. Stephanie Orr was appointed to act as master in chambers. Chief Justice Brian Sykes in his remarks commended the judges. These ceremonies are important because they remind us and a reminder of Jamaica's commitment to the rule of law, where the constitution and laws are interpreted and applied by an independent and impartial judiciary. The Jamaican government has been given 2.1 billion US dollars to support its strategic objectives and priorities under the 2018-2021 medium-term socio-economic policy framework. The funds are from the official development assistance of the International Development Partners IDP. The provision was part of an overall 2.2 billion US dollars which includes counterpart funding by the government to finance new and ongoing projects. The funding support comprises loans of 1.5 billion and grants amounting to 595.3 million dollars with disbursements totaling 273.3 million US dollars.
The pilot project for the Jamaica Constabulary Force, JCF's new electronic traffic ticketing system, is expected to come on stream at the end of September. The e-traffic system is designed to save time, improve accuracy, and most importantly, offer safety to officers. Marlon Samuels has more in this report. The new e-traffic ticket system is in keeping with the government's efforts to increase efficiency and effectiveness in policing. JCF Command will decide where is it that we want to, to launch a pilot or what tariff and those persons will get the equipment. The aim of all of this is we want the person who are using the equipment in order to own it, to say this is what I'd love to see happen to it and it is there. So it gives them the feel that the man and the equipment is now in one. The electronic citation systems will replace conventional citation pads with mobile printers, mobile computers or handheld e-ticketing devices. This will result in a migration from a paper-based ticketing system to electronic or e-tickets. All traffic tickets issued with the devices will instantly be uploaded to a centralized database accessible by the Jamaica Constabulary Force. It also allows the traffic court to within seconds of the citation being issued access the records of the traffic violation. In contrast, the average time to transfer paper-based citation records is reportedly more than 12 days. Improved accuracy of the information recorded by the law enforcement officer created by the use of the new system will give the police time to pay greater focus on major crimes. 100 handheld devices for the electronic recording of tickets will be rolled out across selected parishes at the end of September. For the news on PBCJ, I am Marlon Samuels. The deadline for the submission of nominations for the Prime Minister's National Youth Awards for Excellence has been extended to September 18 at 4 p.m. The Youth Awards is open to all Jamaican nationals, ages 15 to 29, who are living in the island and the diaspora. Nominees are invited in the following categories, Agriculture and Agro-Processing, Entrepreneurship or Social Entrepreneurship, Journalism, E-Journalism, media, arts and culture, leadership, environmental protection, nation builder, volunteerism, academics, innovation in science and technology, international achievement, and youth development. Nomination forms can be downloaded by visiting www.youthjamaica.com or the Ministry of Education, Youth and Information's website at moey.gov.jm. A consequence of the COVID-19 pandemic has been an impact on the global demand for oil. We now join Gabriel Thompson for a look at the latest crude prices as well as other market indicators. Here's a business report. In Monday's trading session, the JSE combined index advanced by 1,109 points to close at under 400,000 units. Overall market activity resulted from trading in 75 stocks, of which 33 advanced, 32 declined, and 10 traded firm. The junior market index advanced by 7 points to close at under 3,000 units. Stocks advanced for Access Financial Services, Siboney Group Limited, and Community and Workers of Jamaica Deferred Share. Stocks declined for 138 Student Living Jamaica, Barita Investments Limited, and Berger Paints Jamaica. Trading firm were AMG Packaging and Paper Company, Caribbean Assurance Brokers Limited, and Carreras Limited. Lumber Depot Limited was the volume leader with 11.1 million units, followed by Trans Jamaican Highway Limited with 2.4 million units, and with Sinker Group Limited Ordinary Shares with 1.3 million units. Now for the foreign exchange. The U.S. dollar on Monday, September 14 ended trading at $143.57. The Canadian dollar sold for an average $108.70. The pound sterling traded for $185.90. And the euro ended trading at $172.36. 
Oil prices edged slightly higher on Tuesday, but forecasts of a slower-than-expected recovery in global fuel demand due to the coronavirus pandemic weighed. Brent crude futures gained 33 cents to $39.94 a barrel. West Texas intermediate crude futures rose 31 cents to $37.57 a barrel. And that's it for the Business Report on PBCJ. I'm Gabrielle Thompson. In regional news, we start with news from Trinidad and Tobago. Officials at the Ministry of Health are concerned that home quarantined COVID-19 patients are not being honest about their symptoms when contacted by medical personnel for updates on their progress. The matter was raised during Monday's Ministry of Health virtual media conference. Crystal Wilson tells us more. Close to 2,000 COVID-19 patients remain in home quarantine across Trinidad and Tobago. It's a large number, and there appears to be growing concern among medical professionals that many patients are not being upfront and honest when contacted by doctors for progress updates. The matter was raised by Chief Medical Officer of Health, Dr. Janine St. Bernard, during the Health Ministry's press conference on Monday. According to Dr. St. Bernard, people who are infected with the virus and are at home are monitored daily via phone calls. She said within recent times, patients are avoiding sharing information about their symptoms. So patients are sometimes downplaying their symptoms or signs of worsening in order to avoid possible admission to Cora or Kuva Hospital. And that is a dangerous practice and it really should not continue. We are asking you, we are begging you, please contact the physician who's been in contact with you twice daily or you are free to call 811. Dr. St. Bernard said it's important that patients share what symptoms they are experiencing so it can be determined whether they need to be admitted to hospital for further treatment. The GMRTT personnel will visit your home to make an assessment. Sometimes they will visit, they will make an assessment, and when they communicate with us, we would say, okay, we can continue to observe at home. Sometimes when they visit and they make the assessment, after conversation with the specialist medical officer at the hospital, we would make a determination that you need to be admitted. And for those who suffer with asthma or other related illnesses and might display similar symptoms to COVID-19, the chief medical officer of health suggested these people be seen by a doctor urgently. Increasing shortness of breath, headaches, dizziness, being in and out of consciousness, uncoordinated movements, or even drowsiness. These are some signs of worsening symptoms. Some other signs include increasing fatigue. You are just tired and you cannot shake it. Chills, persistent fever, as well as chest pain or discomfort. Home quarantined COVID-19 patients were also reminded not to drop their hygiene standards as proper practice is imperative to their recovery and will also save the lives of people they live with. Crystal Wilson, TTT News. Pharmacists in Barbados who say they've been fighting for additional best practices in the industry for years have welcomed proposed amendments to the legislation that would outlaw unregulated establishments. More in this report. Past president of the Barbados Pharmaceutical Society, Paul Gibson, who was part of a team that made an input into the impending law announced yesterday by Minister of Health and Wellness, Lieutenant Colonel Jeffrey Bostick, said the improvements augur well for pharmacists and patients. The where housing laws are also going to change mm -hmm. because of a couple of incidences where um, persons just thought that they could bring in stuff and start to sell and sell product in Barbados. Mm -hmm not realizing that they needed the authorization of the Barbados Pharmacy Council um, to begin to practice. Um, a pharmacist must be present if you are um, selling pharmaceutical agents in, in, in any warehouse. Okay. Right? A pharmacist must be present. And therefore, because pharmacists come, come under the regulation of the Pharmacy Council, um, it is only natural for those persons to apply right. and be given to author given authorization by the council um, to, to practice in that space. A family of five in St. Lucia are now homeless after a fire ravaged their home. We hear more in this report. An early morning house fire sent a Cedar Heights Viewfort family fleeing for their lives when flames consumed their home. 
According to one of the occupants, Donovan Clifford, he was nodding off around 2 a.m. when he thought the electricity went out. But what he considered to be a power outage turned out to be much worse. Clifford says before he knew it, the house was fully engulfed in flames. I was watching some television and I, well, my television went, it went off. I didn't really take that for anything. I just thought it was a power outage. But um, then I started hearing some, like some crackling, some, some noises, like a, a noise. But like I was feeling sleepy, I wanted to sleep also. And then I heard another noise from my sister's boyfriend and herself, like she's screaming. So then, and I opened the door, my room door. And I look, I see like flames. I say, wow, because I mean, it's like I could not even see the rest of the house. It was just flames. Clifford says he attempted to go back into the burning house in hopes of salvaging some of his belongings. However, his sister advised against it. I tried to rush out of the house, yeah, which I did. It took me some time because I could not even open the door. It took me some time to open that door. When I entered the door, I had to pass at the back of the house to check on my, my, well, my, the rest of my family. But everybody was out already. The children asked for them. Everybody was safe already. So I tried to go back in to try and save some things in my room. But I had to listen to my sister because she told me to go back in the house, you know, because that house was, it was in a mess already. But I don't know what I was thinking I wanted to go back in there, but I had to leave it alone. The Cedar Heights resident says someone tried to tackle a huge blaze by hurling buckets of water at the fire to no avail. The fire service was finally able to extinguish the blaze. I had a neighbor of mine, Buzz, we call him Buzz. He was helping me send some buckets of water to try and put it out, but <laughs> that was just nothing. It's like we don't in the fire anything, the bucket of water. But the fire brigade came there. Yeah, they they helped out, yeah. It is to them although like they could I see like when they reached there the water they had a water issue. But then they did their best. Sources claim that the family was able to walk away with the refrigerator, stove and the clothes on their backs. Chuakim de Placy, HTS News Force. In sports, we're in the creases with cricket. All is in place for the five upcoming T20 matches between England and West Indies. Of course, the main concern is COVID-19. However, the fixtures are scheduled to be contested behind closed doors in a biosecure environment at the Encora County Ground in Derby in England from September 21 to September 30. In July, the Windies men's team lost 1-2 to hosts England in a three-test series under similar arrangements aimed at reducing the risk of exposure to the novel coronavirus. Since the World Cup final in March, the women's game has been at a standstill due to the pandemic. The Windies squad will include Stephanie Taylor, Afi Fletcher, Hayley Matthews, Alia Elaine, Cherry Ann Fraser, Natasha McLean, Charmaine Campbell, Sabika Gajambi, Brittany Cooper, Shaneta Grimmons, Karishma Ramharak, Shamila Connell, and more. And that's the news on PBCJ. Thank you so much for watching. And on behalf of our hardworking and production team, continue viewing PBCJ. We are the People's Station.